they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and they began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and they sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving there, the officers did not find them, so they went back and reported, We found the jail securely locked and all the guards standing in place, but when we opened the doors, no one was inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priest were puzzled, wondering what would come from all of this. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with the officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force this time because they feared that the people would stone them. Having brought the apostles, they made them appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in that name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you're determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus up, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. We are witnesses of these things and so is the Holy Spirit to whom God, God has given those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and they wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed them, men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Jump down with me to verse 38, if you would. 38, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourself fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak anymore in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy to suffer disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you that the power of the Holy Spirit is always with us. Come, Holy Spirit, change our lives today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Beloved, God has called you to an uncontainable life. Jesus said that the kingdom of God is an uncontainable spiritual force in the world. In fact, the kingdom of God is an uncontainable force inside of you. Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is like a little pinch of yeast. When you introduce that little bit of life into a lump of static dough, you can't contain its power until it transforms the entire mass. Acts chapter 5 records another important milestone in the expansion of God's uncontainable kingdom on earth. This story tells us that we serve an uncontainable God. He is the commander of an uncontainable angelic army. He is the author of an uncontainable gospel, and he is the head of an uncontainable church. In Jesus, we have received uncontainable salvation life. God has bestowed upon us the uncontainable gift of the Holy Spirit. He has given us his spirit without measure. He's filled us to overflowing with uncontainable joy and he's called us to be uncontainable witnesses to his uncontainable love for mankind. Beloved, the Lord wants to encourage you today in Jesus, you are uncontainable. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, you uncontainable. This is the story of the first of three miraculous jailbreaks in the book of Acts. God sent an angel to supernaturally 
open the locked doors of the public prison. After the angel led the apostles to freedom, he reaffirmed God's call on their lives. Go, stand your ground in the temple and tell the people the full message of this salvation life. As I look at this story, I find three things that God's call to an uncontainable life means for us. And I want to share them with you quickly this morning. Three things that our call to an uncontainable life means. First of all, I find that God has called you to provoke jealousy. God has called you to provoke jealousy. This is a story that is full of ironies. The first irony that stands out to me is that the guys who had everything in the world became jealous of the guys who had nothing in the world except Jesus. The chief priest and the other ruling Sadducees rose up and arrested the apostles because they were jealous of them. You know, humanly speaking, the Sadducees had everything in life a Jew could wish for. They were at the very center of Jewish faith and Jewish politics. The office of the high priest belonged to them. Authority over the temple belonged to them. Control of the Jewish Supreme Court belonged to them. These were the most powerful Jewish men on planet Earth. They were Jewish nobility. They were highly educated. They were wealthy. They were esteemed. They were revered. And they became jealous of whom? Of fishermen from Galilee, the boondocks of Israel. These men were hicks. They were unlearned. They were itinerant faith healers. These were the guys who introduced themselves as silver and gold we do not have. You know, everyone dreams about how great it would be to be at the top. But did you ever notice how unsatisfied and how insecure people at the top often are? I think about King David Think about all of his accomplishments. I think about all of his admirers, all of his accumulations, and all of the wives that he had, but he couldn't keep his eye off of the one little lamb, Bathsheba, that belonged to another man. The great King Ahab in his palace with all of the lands that he controlled and, and everything that he had within his grip, he couldn't keep his eye off of the one little vineyard that belonged to Naboth kind of reminds me of that scene from the musical Camelot when King Arthur and Guinevere are tired of bearing the burdens of royalty and so they sit around wondering what do simple folks do. They wish for the simplicity of peasant life only to come to the conclusion that the simple folk sit around wondering what do royalty do. And isn't that the whole conundrum of human existence? The grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. The great long for simplicity and the simple long for greatness. Whether great or simple, it seems that in the heart of every human, there's a longing, there's an aching for some kind of ultimate fulfillment that the thrills of life and accomplishments and accumulations just can't satisfy. And when someone does find that ultimate fulfillment, it provokes jealousy in others. Once again, in the book of Acts, we see in operation the gift of the Holy Spirit called discerning of spirits. Discerning of spirits is the supernatural ability to identify the spirit behind an attitude, an action, or an utterance. Already in Acts 5, the Holy Spirit revealed to Peter that it was envy in the hearts of Ananias and Sapphira that motivated them to make a deceptive offering. And again, here in Acts 5.17, the Holy Spirit has revealed the heart motivation behind the arrest of the Sadducees. It wasn't religious zeal. It wasn't preservation of peace in the, in the city of Jerusalem. It wasn't even political survival. The motivation behind the apostles' arrest was jealousy. 
the guys who had everything in the world were jealous of the guys who had nothing in the world but Jesus. Beloved, I believe that the Holy Spirit is here this morning to give you an upgrade in the gift of discerning of spirits. Someone has risen up against you. Someone has taken action against you. They've tried to shut you out. They've tried to beat you up. They've tried to lock you down. And you've struggled to understand what is it that is motivating them to do this to me. I want to tell you it's jealousy. The apostles didn't have fancy pedigrees. They didn't have education. They didn't have prominent positions. They didn't have property. They didn't have valuable possessions. So what about them could possibly provoke jealousy? And what about our lives provokes jealousy in others too? I find a few things here. One thing I find is a compelling sense of purpose. A compelling sense of purpose. Someone once said, until a man finds a cause worth dying for, he hasn't really lived. What bugged the Sadducees is that the apostles were more committed to their faith than were the Sadducees to the Jewish faith. These men had found a cause worth living for and a cause worth laying their lives down for. They had found a cause worth sacrificing everything for. Deep inside, their spirits was an unrelenting conviction that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The Sanhedrin was furious. We gave you strict orders not to speak in that name. They had the inclination and the wherewithal to put the apostles to death. But I love the pure conviction of Peter's answer. We must obey God. No backpaddling, no moderation, no apology, no recanting. You know, their conviction reminds me of Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego when they answered the king. Our God can deliver us and we believe he will deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we will not worship your idol, O king. I know God can. I believe God will. But no matter what, I'm going to praise him. Their conviction was like Daniel's when he knelt before his open window and prayed to his God for help. Beloved, that kind of compelling sense of purpose always provokes jealousy in the hearts of men who lack it. Nebuchadnezzar was jealous. Daniel's colleagues and his subordinates were jealous. The Sanhedrin was jealous. But I want to tell you, a man who has found that kind of purpose in life is uncontainable. Flames cannot kill his faith. Lions cannot devour his determination. And prison bars can never hold back his witness. What could possibly provoke them to jealousy? Another thing I find is this. In Incomprehensible peace. Incomprehensible peace. You know, Jesus prophesied that this moment would come. He told the disciples, when they arrest you, do not worry. And they didn't worry. When they were arrested, they didn't put up a fight. They didn't try to run. They didn't try to start a riot, which they could have easily done. In fact, they were in complete control. They were confident and calm and collected, they were at peace. Just like someone else who also stood in front of the Sanhedrin. The Sadducees were astonished by the apostles' demeanor. They noticed that being with these men was just like being with Jesus. You know, it's no surprise. Before Jesus returned to the Father, he told us, My peace I give you. My peace I bequeath to you, I bestow upon you. Just like the mantle for ministry that was on Elijah fell down on Elisha, the mantle of Jesus' own peace has fallen down on me and on you. The peace that Jesus left us is the shalom of God. Shalom is the wholeness of personhood that comes from walking in covenant relationship with the Father. There's nothing missing and there's nothing broken inside of me. 
Beloved, listen to me. All the wholeness of Jesus' own personhood has been transferred to you. If you're a man, that means perfect masculinity has been transferred to you. If you're a woman, that means perfect femininity has been transferred to you. Jesus' own sense of intrinsic worth in God has now become ours. Jesus' own sense of inner security is now ours. His own confidence is now ours. His own joyfulness is now ours. His own composure and clear-headedness in a crisis is now ours. His own serenity is ours. The Sadducees had a lock on every possible means of earthly security, and yet they were plagued by insecurity. The apostle had zero means of earthly security, and yet they were incomprehensibly at peace. Beloved, that is peace that passes understanding. And it made the Sanhedrin as jealous as all get out. Beloved, I want to tell you, as we move towards 2013, the world's freaking out. They're worried about the Mayans. They're worried about the Middle East. They're worried about the fiscal uh, cliff that we're all about to go over. Let's provoke, some, let's provoke some jealousy by keeping our peace as we go into 2013. God's rescuing angel in the night is a reminder that he's still on the throne and he's still firmly in control. So let's have incomprehensible peace. What could possibly provoke jealousy? A third thing I find is this, the shine that comes from putting in your time with God. The shine that comes from putting in your time with God. The Sadducees were jealous of the miracles that the apostles performed and the popularity that it earned them. They were jealous of the limelight but Peter reveals that those moments of public applause had come only because a private life of persistent obedience to God had come first. Peter said, God has given us the Holy Spirit because we have been obedient to him. They had followed Jesus for three years. In spite of their fear of the Sanhedrin, they obeyed Jesus' command to return to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. In spite of the Sanhedrin's threat, they obeyed Jesus' call to be his witnesses in Jerusalem again and again and again. You see, daily obedience to God over the long haul had led to their shining moment in the public spotlight. And the Sadducees were jealous of it. A while back ago, we used to do a live nativity here at harvest time. Actually, praying about bringing back the live nativity in 2013. What do you think? Would you, would you like to, the, to do the live nativity again? All right. I'm getting your commitment before I tell you how much work it's going to be. I, I remember this amazing phenomenon happened during the performances. We had a children's choir that had practiced for months leading up to the live nativity. Every week, moms and dads raced around like crazy, traveling from all across the area in traffic to get their kids early for choir practices. We had volunteers serving pizza. We had women who sewed costumes, and a tremendous amount of work went into preparing for the live nativity. And then, during the performances, people from the community began picking their kids up and putting them on the choir risers while our children's choir was singing and taking pictures of them. I've never seen anything like it. And I was elated at first. I thought to myself, this is great. The children's choir is going to draw tons of people to church on Wednesday nights. We're going we're to reach families. We're going to pull people in because they want to be part of the children's choir. But after January 1st, none of them came back. See, they just wanted their kids to shine without putting in the time. I can, I can hardly imagine a life more unfulfilling than that. I can't imagine years from now flipping through the pictures and, and looking at the memories. Oh yeah, that's the Christmas that we pretended that our kids were part of the children's choir. <laughs> See, if you haven't done the work... 
if you haven't put in the time, then the applause is hollow. But a lot of people live just that way. They want to shine without putting in the time. When you live a life of persistent obedience to God, one day your moment will come and the Holy Spirit is going to make you publicly shine. And when He does, someone will be jealous of it. What an irony. The guys who had absolutely everything in the world became jealous of the guys who had nothing in the world except Jesus. Many years ago, a Christian friend of mine was employed in the home of one of Greenwich's wealthiest men. This man was famous and he was a multi, multi, multi gazillionaire. And my friend was really struggling hard to make ends meet, to build his business, to raise his family. These two men were worlds apart from one another in every way, but they ate lunch together almost every day. And the wealthy man would always ask my friend questions about his faith in God and about his family and about his everyday life. One of the last times they ever had lunch together before the wealthy man passed away, he turned and he said to my friend, I wish I could be you. I wish that you and I could trade places. I wish that I could have your life. Beloved, an uncontainable life means that we're called to provoke jealousy. I wonder whom you're provoking these days. Three things that the call to an uncontainable life means for us. Secondly, this. An uncontainable life means that God has called you to stand your ground until Jerusalem is filled with your teaching. God has called you to stand your ground until Jerusalem is filled with your witness. See? That's good, right? That's, I'm glad the power came back on her. You would have been deprived of that funny picture. There's another irony I find in the jailbreak story. It's that God sent an angel to deliver the apostles in the middle of the night. The Sadducees had seized the apostles forcefully and had put them in jail publicly as a public display of their power. And they didn't believe in angels. That's why they were so sad, you see. <laughs> but beloved, listen, what the Sadducees did publicly, God undid privately by a means that they didn't believe was even possible. There's a word from the Holy Spirit for somebody in this house this morning. What man has done to you publicly, God is about to undo for you privately through a means that you never even believed possible. To man belong the plans of the heart, but the answer that comes is from the Lord. Listen, when people messing with you, they're messing with God. You better tell people. You better be careful, Jack. You, 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 you owe it to people to warn them. You, you better give them a fair warning. You better watch it, Jack. You messing with me. You messing with God. What you, you, better, you better watch what hand signals you make to me. You make a hand signal to me. You're making a hand signal to God. You better watch what you say. What, God has, what man has done publicly, God is going to undo privately. God sent the angel to reaffirm their call. Go back. Stand your ground in the temple and deliver the full message of this salvation life. I find in the angel's message three words of guidance for our mission that I want to share. Three words of guidance for our mission. First of all this. Contend for the middle ground in your culture. Contend for the middle ground in your culture. You know, the apostles probably could have avoided all of this hullabaloo if they had just played it cool. If they had just kept fellowshipping in their homes and loving on one another and taking communion together, that they probably could have stayed under the radar. But God's plan wasn't for them to lay low. 
God's plan wasn't for them to keep a low profile. God sent them to the temple. Go stand your ground in the temple. Go teach in the temple. The temple was the center of Jewish national and spiritual life. God sent them there because he didn't want them to merely survive on the fringes. God wanted them to contend for the middle ground. Beloved, listen to me. Can I tell you, it is more important than ever that you and I stand our ground in American culture. As we see our country drifting further and further and further away from God, this is not the time for the church to withdraw from national debate and national dialogue. This is not the time for us to maintain a low profile. We mustn't allow society to relegate us to the fringes. It's more important than ever that we let our voice be heard and that it's heard clearly. It's more important than ever that we contend for the heart of America. The apostles' message then and our message now is that God's offer of forgiveness is on the table. Take the deal. That's what Peter's words meant to the Sanhedrin. He, he gave them an offer of repentance and forgiveness. And if God could make an offer of repentance and forgiveness to the Sanhedrin and to the people of Jerusalem who had killed his only son, how much more could God yet make an offer of repentance and forgiveness for America? Beloved, it's not too late for our country. It's not too late for our culture. More and more stubborn people in the book of Acts said yes to God. And more and more stubborn people can still say yes to Him today. Three words of guidance for our mission. Second, this. Refuse to compromise the content of the gospel because of social or political pressure. Refuse to compromise the content of the gospel because of social or political pressure. The angel said, tell the people the full message of this salvation life. In other words, the angel saying, don't cave under pressure. Don't dilute your message. Don't withhold any part of the truth. Don't soft pedal the uncomfortable, inconvenient parts of the gospel message. The Sanhedrin was complaining. Why do you insist on making us guilty of this man's blood? Why do you have to implicate us? Why do you have to try to pin it on us? Why do you have to be so confrontational? Why do you have to get up all in our grill? <laughs> Beloved, I want to tell you, God's wonderful demonstration of love in Jesus Christ is only half of the gospel message. The other half of the gospel message is that our Response is required. We're required to recognize our hopelessly sinful state. We're required to uh, own up to our transgressions against God and against our fellow men to recognize that we are each guilty of His blood and to humbly repent and receive His forgiveness. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Tell the people the full message of this salvation life. Three words of guidance for our mission. Another one is this. Don't you dare quit until the people around you are fed up completely with your witness. Don't you dare quit until the people around you are fed up completely with your witness. The angel's message was, go back to the temple. Your work is not finished. Your assignment is not over. You still have more talking to do. You still have more testifying to do. You still have more witnessing to do. You know, that's remarkable when you consider the words of the Sanhedrin. They said to the apostles, we gave you strict orders not to teach in that name, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. Beloved, Jerusalem was already completely saturated with the gospel. The, the people were filled up 
with the message of Jesus. And yet the angel said, it is not enough. Give him some more. In 1976, the queen entertained the brutal dictator from Uganda, Idi Amin. She gave a very lavish luncheon in his honor. And at the end of the luncheon, Idi Amin got up to make a famous speech. You should go online and read it. But it opened this way. Dear Mr. Queen, we have really eaten very much and we are fed up completely. I wish to invitation you, Mr. Queen, to come to Uganda so that we can also revenge on you. Of course, what Idi Amin meant was we have eaten very well and we hope we can reciprocate your hospitality. But I think his wording describes well the situation in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was already fed up completely with the gospel and the Sanhedrin had invited the apostles in to take revenge on them. They were saying, enough already. But God was saying, give them more. Beloved, listen to me. Don't ever let anyone tell you that America has had too much evangelism, that it's had too much preaching, that it's had too much of the gospel. Don't ever let your family tell you enough already. The Sanhedrin said, Jerusalem is already filled with your message, but God's word is give them some more. If you've told your family once, if you've told them twice, if you've told them three times about Jesus, tell them again. Don't stop telling them the full message of this salvation life that comes through Jesus. You know, this is a good time to talk about this because many of you are going to be with your families over the holidays. And for some of you, it's been a long time since you've gone down that road. When you were a new believer, you used to bring up Jesus all the time. You made him crazy. You made him nuts. They'd see you coming for Christmas. They'd go in the kitchen if you were in the living room. If you came in the kitchen, they'd go downstairs to the family room to get away from you. Come on. But you don't go there anymore. I've tried. They're, they're fed up with my sharing about Jesus. God says, good. If they're fed up, go tell them again. Beloved, let me tell you something. Every time you share Jesus with them, you're just one time closer to that moment that's coming when they finally say yes to God. James said that you were saved to be the first fruits in your family, the first of many kind. It's not a matter of if your family's coming to Jesus. It's a matter of when they're coming to Jesus. One of the great messages out of this chapter is that our call to evangelize those closest to us is not a sprint, it's a marathon. Acts 6 goes on to record the result of their continuous preaching. The result was that the Jerusalem church exploded more in growth. And even a large number of priests, of Jewish priests, became believers in Jesus. People who said no once, twice, three times, four times, finally said yes to God. Beloved, listen to me. May God give you grace. Don't you dare quit until you have thoroughly witnessed Jesus to those who are closest to you. Jerusalem is your home. Jerusalem is your family. Jerusalem is your close circle of friends. Jerusalem is your neighborhood, your community. It's your workplace. Don't you quit until they are fed up completely. Three things that the call to an uncontainable life means for us. Finally this. God has called you never to be ashamed to suffer for the name. Pastor Jason, Melissa, you can come and help me. God has called you to never be ashamed to suffer for the name. Another irony I find in the jailbreak story is that the apostles felt honored to suffer public disgrace. They were publicly seized and roughed up by the temple police. Their motto was not courtesy, respect, and professionalism, okay? They were publicly jailed. At the conclusion of the second trial, they were publicly flogged. It was a humiliating experience. But all of these attempts on the part of the Sanhedrin to humiliate them had precisely the opposite effect. Instead of becoming discouraged, they rejoiced. 
Instead of being intimidated, they were emboldened. Instead of being humiliated, they felt honored. The Sadducees had complete disdain for the name. During the trial, they couldn't even bring themselves to utter the name of Jesus. They referred to Jesus as that name, that man. But the apostles refused to be ashamed of the name. You know, this episode represents a turning of the tide in Jerusalem. Up until chapter 5, the apostles face opposition from the leadership, but they're very popular with the people. But, but not after this. Widespread persecution is about to break out. Beloved, can I tell you that the tide has turned in America? Everyone's worried about going over the fiscal cliff, but can I tell you a far greater concern is that we've gone right over the moral cliff. More and more and more, there's widespread disdain for the name of Jesus. Anti-Christian rhetoric and anti-Christian sentiment is spreading like wildfire through our culture. It's quite possible that very soon we could see an escalation in persecution. But listen, let's stop drawing the wrong conclusions from people's negative reactions to us. You know, when people react negatively to our faith, we're quick to conclude there must be something wrong with us. We, we think there must be something wrong with my message. There must be something wrong with my methods. And we begin to struggle with self-doubt. But when the apostles faced the negative reaction of the people based on the words of Jesus, they concluded we must be on the right track. Listen to this, because this is good preaching right here. Resistance doesn't occur because you're not making headway, but precisely because you are. Resistance means you're exerting pressure. Resistance means you're making a dent. And remember this, when it feels like you're not making any headway, remember that somebody is always watching, somebody is always listening, somebody is always this far from faith. Turns out the Jesus movement had a very unlikely advocate, Gamaliel, the most honored of all the Jewish uh, teachers that were living during that time. Gamaliel watched their conviction. He watched their lives. He watched the incomprehensible peace. He, he watched the miracles and the signs and the wonders. And, and he was moved just this far from faith. Beloved, when society resists us, let's not conclude that we're not making headway, but rather let's take it as a sign that we're pushing in the right direction and never, ever, ever be ashamed of the name of Jesus. Never be ashamed to endure pain for the sake of that great name. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob raised up Jesus whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. But God has exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might offer repentance and the forgiveness of sins. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. God has called you to an uncontainable life to provoke jealousy, to stand your ground, and to never be ashamed of that name. I want you to stand to your feet right now, and I want you to join me in giving a great big praise to Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Come on, let's give him a big praise. I know you can do just a little better than that. Come on, let's give him a big praise. Come on, would you say that name of Jesus? Jesus, we magnify you. Jesus, we honor you. Jesus, we glorify you. Jesus, we praise you. Hallelujah. Come on, lift up your voice. Come live in me all my life. Take over. Would you sing it as a prayer? And come live in me all my life. 
take over and come breathe in me and I will rise on eagles wings come breathe in me and all my life take over in this place. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lift up your hands. Come on, I want you to just make a declaration. I am uncontainable. I'm unstoppable. I'm unquenchable. I am incorrigible. I'm uncontainable. In Jesus' name. Beloved, while I was just in prayer yesterday, the Holy Spirit put in my heart to make some declarations over you today in the realm of the Spirit. And I just feel as we're coming to the end of 2012 and we're, we're arriving to the threshold of 2013, we're arriving to a new year, I just felt like there were some things that God put in my spirit to speak over you and to declare over you about an uncontainable life, about an uncontainable season that's coming. I want to invite you, if you would, if you lift up your hands to the Lord, and I want you to just open your spirit, and I, I want you to just receive as I share over you what the Holy Spirit gave me while I was in prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I reaffirm to you that God has called you to an uncontainable life. You are now the recipient of uncontainable salvation life. You are now the recipient of the uncontainable gift of the Holy Spirit. He's given you the Spirit without measure. You are now the recipient of uncontainable joy and uncontainable peace. Jesus has bestowed upon you his own shalom, the wholeness of his own personhood. In the name of Jesus, I speak over you inner security. In the name of Jesus, I speak over you intrinsic sense of worth to God. I speak over you the ability to share and to receive intimate love. I speak over you confidence. Men, I speak over you complete masculinity. Ladies, I speak over you complete femininity in the name of Jesus. I speak over you clear-mindedness. I speak over you composure in every situation. You are called to a life of uncontainable witness. In the name of Jesus, I speak over you uncontainable faith. I speak over you unquenchable passion for Jesus. I speak over you irrepressible witness and innumerable results. Now in the name of Jesus, I announce over you open doors at the start of the coming year. I announce open doors of employment. I announce over you open doors of business opportunity. I announce over you open doors of housing, of transportation, and education. I announce over you in the name of Jesus open doors of new relationships and open doors of ministry. I declare over you in the name of Jesus supernatural interventions and angelic visitations. I declare deliverance from life-controlling habits and addictions. I declare deliverance from physical, emotional, and mental illness for you and your children and your grandchildren. I declare rescue from unhealthy and unsafe situations. I declare revelation containing supernatural guidance of your footsteps. I declare fresh vision and a supernatural strengthening in your innermost being. I also declare over you in the name of Jesus, 
unlikely advocates to rise up and speak persuasively on your behalf. Unlikely advocates for you are rising up in the workplace, in the marketplace, in the business community. Unlikely advocates are rising up for you to speak persuasively in the courts. Unlikely advocates are rising up to speak persuasively in the banks, in every area of your life. I speak unlikely advocates. And finally, I declare over you a release of supernatural joy for the journey in the coming new year. I declare discouragement shall be turned to rejoicing. Intimidation shall be turned to boldness. And I declare that humiliation will be declared to honor. I declare to you that you are uncontainable in 2013 in the name of Jesus Christ. Come on, give him a big praise in this place. Hallelujah. Come on, lift up your voice. Come live in me. Live in me. In all my life. Somebody say, you're uncontainable. You're uncontainable. You can't be stopped. You're irrepressible. You're incorrigible in your faith in Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Take the hand of somebody next to you. We're going to close our service with a word of prayer. Uh, when we do, if you'd like to receive personal prayer, you can come to the altar as soon as we dismiss, and we'll be happy to pray and minister to you. How many of you know this is going to be a great week coming up this week? Jesus, your beautiful shepherd, he's gone out ahead of you. He's moved the enemy out of your way. It's, it's Sunday here, but Jesus has already been through your Monday and your Tuesday. He's telling you the week looks pretty good for you. He, he's seeking out the best pasture for you. He leads me beside still waters and, and green pastures. Good opportunities are coming your way. Something's going to happen. There's going to be an answer to prayer this week. Some serendipity is coming your way this week. There's going to be there's going to be a connection. People are talking about you in a good way behind the scenes. You don't even know it, but you're going to get a phone call this week because over this weekend people had discussions about you and, and your name came up and, and something good's going to break for you this week in Jesus' name. Let's give thanks. Father, thank you now for this time in your presence. God, as we go our own way today, I pray that the cloud of your presence would envelop us. Father, I pray that your protection would surround us. Pray that your provision would accompany us. Pray that your providence would lead us and your peace encircle us until we come together again.